Starliner Media. Starliner Media presents Music Night at the Majestic with your host, Michael Boswell. All right, once again, time for Music Night at the Majestic. And with us tonight, Jack Starr. Jack, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's uh, my pleasure, and I hope all you guys out there are doing great. We're doing as, as great as we can. Right. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Burning Star's got the new album out, Souls of the Innocent, and uh, we'll get to that. But uh, one of the things we always say on this show is, you know, every musician's journey starts somewhere. Yes. And uh, for you, from what I remember yeah, uh, seeing, you were like, what, about 12 when you first picked up the guitar? But, you know, it took you a few years before you got serious about it, if I remember right. You're right. Um, I got my first guitar. I was 12 years old. Uh, I kind of convinced my mom to get me a guitar. And uh, I found that I uh, j didn't take to it like, a, you know, I just, uh, it was difficult. Uh, also, you know, back then they really didn't make very playable guitars. Like a beginner guitar back then was really hard to play. Uh, I had the strings were very difficult to push down on. And anyway, uh, I just thought, you know, this isn't for me. I'm going to just put this under my bed and, uh, you know, maybe one day. So that day did come about four years later. I was walking down the hall of my junior high school and it was only about three or four of us that actually had long hair and looked like troublemakers that were into rock and roll. <laughs> so uh, anyway, this, I talked to this guy, you know, and I go, I go, you play guitar, don't you? And he goes, yeah. And, and, and I, then I said, I have a guitar very proudly. You know, like, not I play guitar, just. <laughs> but I have one. I have one, yeah, it's under my bed. So anyway, one thing led to another, we, you know, we became friendly and then I said, you know, it would be really cool if you let me know if my guitar is any good, if it's playable. And if it is, you know, maybe you can show me a couple of things on the guitar. So he came over, the guitar was actually somewhat playable. It was really the fact that I didn't want to really put the effort into it. And anyway, he showed me uh, a couple of, things by the rolling stones and um hey the guy's name was actually richie michelle that was his last name michelle uh i think he might have been a french origin so uh yeah so he showed me a couple of rolling stone you know things and i realized this isn't that hard you know i can play uh round and round by the rolling stones i can play uh you know all that stuff you know little red rooster uh, it's a three chord blues progression. There's three chords. So for God's sakes, I can't be that, you know, that horrible. I should be able to <laughs> master those three chords. And I did. And, uh, one thing led to another and I found that I could build, you know, from the, the knowledge that I had and just keep building on it. And here we are a hundred years later and I think I've gotten better at it. <laughs> well, to tell me this jack the uh did, did you get the guitar because you were really into music or was it a you know, kind of a left field gift um no actually i was really into it i just didn't really want to put the work in at first but i was really into it uh you know i was i was hearing you know the beatles and you know led zeppelin one and uh, 10 years after, and uh, Black Sabbath, and they all were very uh, guitar-driven albums. Uh, you know, the guitar was very predominant, uh, especially like in 10 years after, you know, Alvin Lee was just ripping it up. Uh, and so, yeah, I was really into it. I really was hoping that I could actually master this thing, you know? Yeah, were you a big record buyer? I was. Um, what was the I first really one was, you remember I, buying? What? What's the first what? one you remember buying? Uh, I would have to say it was uh, it was the Rolling Stones. 
you know i was never a huge beatle fan though I, though i did grow to like uh a lot of what they did later on like especially uh when revolver came out uh and then you know uh abbey road and uh i really liked the later things that the beatles did uh the white album but the stones uh i basically liked everything they did you know from the beginning to to now there was just there's something very cool and bluesy that that i resonated with you know yeah now did you did the the stones records lead you to get into the into following the blues artists and guitarists yeah actually they did i was curious like where were they getting all this stuff from you know even the name where did they get that cool name from and then i found out it was uh, a song you know by muddy waters rolling stone blues and and where were they coming up with you know this, these great songs like you know it's all over now and time is on my side i thought time is on my side had to have been an original song but it was actually an r b song it was a hit uh before they covered it so uh it made me want to go back you know i really so so that was really cool that uh i started wanting to listen to muddy waters and jimmy reed and t-bone walker and uh i'm gonna guess freddie king probably figures in there too absolutely in fact uh funny you mentioned freddie king freddie king bb king albert king uh if martin luther king had made an album back then i would have bought it <laughs> but uh all three kings were great absolutely well in, in your playing you can hear that influence yeah and i'm glad that you noticed that because uh it's definitely part of you know part of who i am and, and what i sound like and uh you know even like you know a lot of these not only say a lot of metal guys but some of the metal guys that i like you can hear uh the phrasing is blues uh derived and i think that's a cool thing yeah well to, to me jack the one of the the keys with blues guitar is as you said the phrasing the the guitar is almost like a a, a vocalist yeah within the within the band absolutely and in vocals uh there's beginnings and end to vocal phrases they don't just go on and on and on uh it's like so, so you say a phrase like in a song you know i don't know just any example you could think of uh and then the phrase ends and then there might could be a little chord on the guitar it could be a little riff but in guitar it should be the same thing if you're doing a guitar solo it should have phrases and it should be kind of like the human voice so i'm trying to give you an example but like um let's say i don't know let, let's say like uh okay let's say judas priest song you know living after midnight okay that's a phrase then the next thing rock into uh, it's not living after midnight rock into the call rah, blah, blah, blah. now some guitar players unfortunately and i'm not going to name names <laughs> the way they play is like and there's no phrasing it's just like how fast can i play and how many notes can i squeeze in and how you, you, you know how flamboyant can i be you know and impress people so i'm more you know the other school when i yeah. play guitar uh maybe it's because i'm I can't play that fast. I don't know. It's you know. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I, I feel the same way with vocals. When you hear vocalists get into all the histrionics of it, right? To yeah. me, that takes away from yeah you know, uh, the 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 performance and the lyric itself. It does. It's like, uh, and I really have to lay some of that blame at Mariah Carey. She started this whole school of singing about 
maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago. She does something in in music that has a name for it. It's called glissando. And and what that is, is it's like, oh, 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 oh. so you, you can't just sing a note. It can't be, you know, baby, I love you. It's baby, I love. Oh, oh, oh. It's that the whole glissando thing. She When she started off with that, a lot of females singers wanted to also do that and uh it got overused you know i you know i I think you know just sing the song you know maybe throw in a couple of effects once in a while but over singing is not good over playing is not good right i i often liken it to cooking to where if you overdo one ingredient the whole dish is ruined and that's a great analogy. Sometimes you have to know when to stop. Uh, my um, my fiance Linda is very, you know, she's very into fashion, and she knows quite a bit about it. And she gave me a quote once from Coco Chanel, and Coco Chanel was saying to women, she was saying, "Ladies, before you go out." for the night you know to go whatever to go to the theater or whatever take off one article whether it's a necklace whether it's a bracelet whether it's a scarf just take off one article because your outfit will look better when you don't overdo it so it's the same thing in cooking in fashion in in guitar in (laughs) In, in life, yeah. I don't know how, this will probably be the first interview you ever did with a metal musician that <laughs> quoted Coco Chanel. Yes, that is the first, and probably the only. And pro- Yeah, it'll never happen again. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the there's times when going big is great. And if it, if it fits the song and it fits the, yeah, the, the mood of the recording, right. great. Yeah. But there's also times where understatement, where those players who can get the most by playing the least really yeah, drives it home. I totally agree. And, and uh, that's why, you know, you have guys like Clapton and Santana that are so revered. Clapton, you know, his nickname was Slowhand. He wasn't trying to prove anything. He's coming out with these wonderful phrases on the guitar, you know, uh, sunshine of your love. You know, the lead is like, and then, and then he goes into a little, and he didn't go like, you know, it was, it would have been too much for that song. Um, So I don't do that. I don't, I try to be more in the Clapton, Santana uh, school of lead playing. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, it kind of drives the bass player in my band a little bit, you know, like, oh, let's tone the blues down. You know, and I understand where he's coming from because, like, when we were recording, um, Ned, who's an incredible bass player, and so he's a person that I would actually, you know, listen to and take their opinion you know, importantly. Um, so we're recording this song and I've got Ned there and Rhino. And these guys are not really fans of blues. So uh, as a lot of people in metal, you know, they just, they're not, for whatever reason, it doesn't float their bubble, you know. So I think we were recording actually the title, I think it was the title song or it could have been Another song that Ned wrote called Ships in the Night. But I'm throwing in these Stevie Ray Vaughan kind of licks. And uh, with each take, you know, I could see that they're like, I could see them getting a little agitated, you know. (laughs) You know, like Jack, you know, we're a metal band, you know. Maybe you could just tone down, you know, the bluesiness of it a bit. And and so I did. And I brought in... uh, uh you know scales guitar scales that are 
definitely not used in blues like the harmonic minor, the mixolydian, the Dorian modes, the Aeolian. The, these are just not found in blues. Now I could I I could be doing some of the same melodies, but you change a couple of notes, and it's not blues anymore. And I could see that that made them happy. That I got rid of the real blues notes, which are pentatonic, you know, kind of blues things, you know, you know. So it's you know there's a compromise there, and I didn't mind doing it because it it did sound good. It was like oh wow, this isn't this is cool, you know. This is another another way of interpreting the mood of this song, and um, and there are guys you know like Leslie West who I love um, that do that. You know, a lot of times like they don't play the obvious. Leslie West. Let's say if the song's in the key of A, he'll play the relative minor of F sharp. And if you listen to songs like Theme from the Imaginary Western or uh, Nantucket Sleigh Ride, all of that is done in the in the relative minor. And uh, and that was just brilliant when I heard that, you know, when I was a kid and I heard him playing and I was like, wow, this is so incredible. He, he must you know, know all this incredible theory. I want to learn what is he doing, you know? I, and then when I finally got the hang of it, I realized that he was just playing the relative minor. So if you're in A, play in F sharp. If you're in E, play in D. If you're in C, play in A minor. And uh, he did that a lot. And I learned a lot from him. Uh, in fact, I you know I learned from all the guys that I love. You know, it was it was more than just sitting back and you know enjoying it. There was also an academic side to my listening, uh, which I didn't know it at the time. <laughs> you know, I just I just thought I was trying to figure out you know what right. he's doing. So my friends would be coming over. Oh, let let's go out and drink some beer and pick up chicks and and I would say, I said no, I'm staying home and practicing and they would just look at me like, man, what a loser! <laughs> you know, what happened? What happened to Jack? You know why? <laughs> but I just, you know, I was okay with it. I I was happy actually to uh, to do that. And then I also found out, you know, like three, four, or five years later. I was good enough to play out. So so now I wasn't staying home. I was actually going out and playing. And I was I was kind of like the center of attention, you know, because mm -hmm. you are playing and, you know, when you're up on stage. And uh, so, so memo to myself, I was right. <laughs> you got the last laugh on that one. I think I did, yeah. But it was all good, you know, and, and, you know, and, you know, literally four, four or five years later, uh, our first gig was opening up for Blue Oyster Cult. Now, what was that like? Well, it was really it was really amazing because they were such a well oiled machine. Uh, it, they just played so tight that it made me really rethink um, how I viewed music and what I wanted to aspire to. I didn't want to be just a bunch of guys jamming and, you know, coming out there and sandals and shorts or whatever, you know, I, I looked up to what they were doing, you know, and this was, this was before they, their first album, their first album was just about to come out. So they were all pretty excited, you know, and they were very nice to, to the opening band, which was us. They were very nice to us. And, um, and they still did a couple of covers. They did uh, Born to be Wild, Roadhouse Blues, and actually they played Whole Lot of Love, which was kind of pretty cool. And um, so anyway, I'm backstage, you know, and, and I got to talk to the guitar player and I said, you know, you guys are awesome. You know, I was kind of like a fanboy, you know, you guys are really good. Yeah. And, and then I said, and, and the way you played Whole Lot of Love was really like incredible. So 
I said, how did you do that? That middle part, you know, on the 12th fret, you know, where Jimmy Page does that fast lick. And he goes, hey, I'll show it to you. Here, grab this guitar and I'll grab the other one. I'll show you how it goes. So to this day, 50 years later or 45 years later, I'm still playing a whole lot of love, the Blue Oyster Cult way. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if yeah. it works. It works. Of course, I don't really play that too much anymore. And I don't know if they still play it either, but, you know, <laughs> but it's all good. Yeah. Well, t t tell me this, Jack. Yeah, if you're uh, besides uh, uh, Blue Oyster Cult, who were some of the other uh, artists or records that you had that were really yeah, important in kind of shaping your tastes and playing? Well, when I was, you know, learning how to play, um, there was heavy metal was coming out. Uh, a lot of people, you know, think, you know, uh, Black Sabbath invented heavy metal. It was actually out before Black Sabbath. There was a band called Blue Cheer, mm -hmm. uh, which were from California, and they they had that incredibly heavy sound. Uh, they did summertime blues, right? And uh, there was uh, you know the MC5, who were really kind of in between metal and punk. Uh, there was an incredible band from New York called Sir Lord Baltimore. And uh, they were playing metal. And then there was a, a band, uh, I think they were from England, they were called Coven. And they had a female singer called, who just went by the name Jinx. Now they were into this whole satanic thing, you know, which kind of like scared me a little bit. It was, you know, a little bit off the wall, but they recorded the song Evil Woman, which Black Sabbath did a cover of before Black Sabbath. And they were doing that whole, you know, satanic uh, image thing before Black Sabbath. Uh, and then you had the Music Machine. They were out, I think, around 67, 68. And uh, these guys all wore black and they, they had black leather gloves. They dyed their hair black. And they weren't singing about flower power. It wasn't about, you know, uh, let's go to San Francisco and wear flowers in our hair. This was about like alienation and about feeling angry and, and you know, pissed off at the world. It was like, it was kind of like what Metallica was singing about, like, you know, but earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was drawn to, to that kind of music, you know, and then when Black Sabbath came out, they kind of like put a lot of the pieces together. Like it was like a jigsaw puzzle and they put a lot of that together. And so they got the credit, but, um, and everybody really in music does that, you know, everybody, everybody is on the shoulders, riding on the shoulders of someone else and they incorporate what came before. And then they add a little bit to the proceedings, you know, well, see, that's the key. Yeah, is yeah, it's great. To, everybody has influences, and right. you you can't escape that because you wouldn't be you know making music if those people didn't have a, a big influence on you. Right. To me, the key is taking all that stuff and making something new. Exactly, and and you know, and that's what uh, Vanilla Fudge did. You know, mm -hmm. when I was uh, when I was growing up, you know, when that album came out, I was blown away. It was like these guys were taking cover songs like you keep me hanging on and transforming them into like epics and um and i could see how like deep purple was tremendously influenced by vanilla fudge mm -hmm. uh so they were really you know on the cusp of that whole thing and i really liked it and i wanted to do that but you know wanting to do something and actually doing it sometimes takes time uh i didn't actually get to do that till 1981 when i started my first uh real band it was called virgin steel and so we were using a lot of that uh epic quality from bands like vanilla fudge and deep purple and and so on and incorporating time changes in the music where like the song might start off in one time signature, but then 
have a middle part that goes into another time signature, uh, having a part in the song maybe where everything slows down and you just hear an acoustic guitar or a piano. Uh, and really, if you think about it, like Stairway to Heaven, it does all that. You know, it starts mm -hmm. off really beautifully. And then by the end of the song, it's in your face metal. It's like, you know, when we wind on down the road, it's like, dan, 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 it's, it gets heavy. Bohemian Rhapsody, same thing. It's a metal song, but you wouldn't be able to tell from the first three, four minutes of it. And then all of a sudden, it's like the curtain is open. And wow, Bohemian Rhapsody, it's a metal song, you know, when, when Brian May goes into the down, 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 Brilliant. Well, in, in the key to those, case, Jack, what's, what's that? I said, I rest my case, Your Honor. <laughs> I was going to say, the, the, the thing with, with songs like that, you, you, what you're doing is you're taking the listener on an audio journey. Yes. And it, it's like a road trip to where you see different scenery in different parts of the country, what have you. Yeah, only it's audible. And by the time yeah. you get there, you are someplace totally different than where you started. And on that initial listen, somewhere you did not expect to go. And you know what? That's a great analogy. I, I have to hand it to you on that one because that's how I felt the first time I heard Stairway to Heaven. And I remember, uh, like it was yesterday, sitting in my living room with my father. We had one of these big uh, TV sets that was also a stereo. It was like it was a console. I think it was like a, a Magnavox console. And I said, Dad, you got to hear this. And my father, you know, liked certain music. You know, he liked he liked Buddy Rich. He liked Frank Sinatra. He did like Gene Cooper. He did like really good drums. So I figured he's going to like the drumming in this band. So we sat down. We listened to Led Zepp, Led Zepp and One. And he goes, he goes, that drummer is really good. And, he goes, and then he goes, you know, that band is really good. And I go, yeah. And because we had taken this trip together. And then um, I remember playing him the Vanilla Fudge. He was blown away by Carmine's drumming. He said, wow, that drummer is amazing, you know. And uh, Well, Carmine's the yeah, big Gene Krupa yeah, influence. Yeah. Oh. Then that's, you know what, then, okay, now it makes sense that he would have uh, really dug Carmine, yeah. You know, because he was into that. He saw the influences. I didn't, you know, if you had asked me, I would have said, you know, John Bonham created everything, you know, or Carmine <laughs> created everything. You know? Yeah. But like I was saying, you know, everybody, all musicians really are taking it and then they're adding their own thing to it. Exactly. Well, and, and that's the, the it, when, when you make something new with it, that's the stuff that, people listen to for you know decades when it's just you know a photocopy if you will there's no point yeah yeah and you know in my own you know humble way i try to do that with guitar and and what i try to do is basically just blend more of who i am which is the blues and the fact that you know i was born in europe i was born in france i came to america you know i was like 10 years old so i had to uh I had to learn English uh, and I watched a lot of Gilligan's Island and everything else. And within about eight months, I was speaking English. Uh, but the, all the European music that I grew up listening to uh, comes out in my playing. Uh, the French are kind of interesting musical taste because when you live in France, you hear classical music on the radio, like, um, I'm talking about like on hit radio, you know, radio mm -hmm. that really gets out there. And, uh, you know, like you'll have like, say, one hour of the greatest hits from America, you know, and that would usually be like a lot of Motown. And, and then the next hour is Jean-Pierre plays the classical hits, you know, and then so all that started starts, you know, it, it seeps in, you, you know, so I, I always was aware of classical music. It was, a, and it wasn't something that was dormant and uh, something that uh, was not a part of who I am. It was, it was what I grew up listening to. No, well, there's a, a lot of metal 
that is classical in nature. Yes. Yeah. In fact, one of the first songs that Virgin Steel really got noticed with was a song that uh, I came up with a, a great deal of it. Um, it's a song called A Cry in the Night. And I'll just give you a quick history on this. Uh, I'm going to try to make it quick, but I was living in France in the 70s. And um, there was a number one hit throughout Europe by a Greek band called Aphrodite's Child. And uh, that band had Vangelis in it on keyboards, the guy that did uh, Chariots of Fire. And that band also had Demis Roussos on vocals. And uh, Demis Roussos became a huge, huge singer, like on Elvis level in Europe. And Vangelis, of course, became huge for being, you know, for doing soundtracks. And anyway, they, so they had this, this hit called called Rain and Tears. It's like one of my favorite songs ever, uh, right up there with Wider Shade of Pale. And uh, so I, I wanted to, to find out, you know, what are the chords in that song, Rain and Tears? And then I realized that he was paraphrasing the chords from a, a, a German composer from the 17th or 18th century named Pachelbel, P-A-C-H-A-B-E-L. And um, that chord progression, the D, A, B minor, F sharp minor, G, D, G, A, that chord progression, I loved it. I was just like, I want to write something or I want to bring that to the band and we'll write something together because it was just such a magnificent progression. And uh, we did. Uh, there's a song on the uh, second version Steel album called A Cry in the Night. And it's really an homage to uh, to Pachelbel, that composer that came up with that chord sequence, and um, and of course we added our own you know bits in it. And Dave, uh, the singer, came up with a wonderful uh, bridge in that song, and uh, and it was the first time on on record that I used this little contraption they called an ebo which is this thing that you slide along the strings and it makes the strings sustain. Uh, it makes the notes sustain, you know, it goes, makes it sound like a cello, actually. Uh, it was the first and last time I ever used it. It was, it was in the studio and uh, Al Falcon, the owner of, uh, of this studio, said, hey, why don't you try it? Give it another flavor. I said, I have no idea how to use this thing. Uh, but I saw there was a little light on it, like a little LED light. I, but I don't think, I don't know if they had even invented LED lights back then. But it was this little light on it. And you would run the this thing through on top of the strings. And it would, it would just sustain it forever. So anyway, yeah. So that's, I digressed a little bit. But that's how the classical thing, and the French thing, you know, impacted on me as a player, and composer, arranger, and all that good stuff. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Wider Shade of Pale. That's another song that, yeah, uh, Paco Bell's canon. It's brilliant. I mean, you know, that is based on a, a Bach uh, thing. I think they called it the Sleepers Awake Cantata. Um, I'm going to be really honest with you. I don't hear it that much, but there are musical experts on the internet that hear it, and I'm not going to question, you know, what they hear. I don't really hear it. Uh, but Gary Broker, I think that was his name, who passed away recently, I think what he did was tremendous. Mm -hmm. That song... Uh, probably one of my top five songs in the rock era of the last 50 years. It's just brilliant. The vocal melody, the, uh, you know, the, that huge orchestral sound, you know, that he's doing. And, uh, and Robin Trower came out of that band and played on that, played on that song. Uh, 
he didn't do a whole lot on that song, but <laughs> that would have been actually very cool if he had uh, maybe done a little solo on that. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe, maybe there's some, uh, you know, lost tracks that the uh, out there they can remix and you know, do the Trower, you know, edition or whatever. Yeah, that would be kind of really interesting, you know. Um, but you know, what's done is done. I mean, you know, every, you know, my feeling is, uh, I like, I, I go with what was done. If, you know, it's like, in other words, I don't need to hear a remix of, uh, Led Zeppelin four, which just, you know, cause I, I'm kind of an audiophile and I kind of really dig vinyl and I don't personally care that Jimmy Page remixed it again like three or four years ago you would think i would as a guitar player but i actually i'm fine with the with the old mastering uh i i meant mastering he i don't know he might have remixed it he, but it got remastered and and that was like a selling point you know buy the new version of uh of let's up in four and for me the old version is great you know i mm. i still have my copy and I ha and I actually bought another copy because as you can imagine, I wore that copy out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I like remastering when technology allows the listener to hear things that were in the mix right. to begin with, but the recording technology didn't allow you to actually hear those little things that were in there. When it gets right. you closer to gets you to what the original was recorded to be i'm good sometimes you yeah. go in there and they'll increase you know the levels on this instrument or that instrument and then right. to me it takes it away from what was there to begin with right and then you discover maybe another layer of sound or <clears throat> another track that was kind of hidden you know uh i like music like that where uh there's different layers and you can kind of uh, discover more as the years go by and uh that's great i mean that's like taking the listener on an adventure and you can do that when it's well recorded and the sound is transparent um right. and that's something you know that i want to say about our new album um it's really well produced uh not all metal can say that you know a lot of it sometimes it's too guitar heavy or too distortion or the drums are so processed that they bleed into the the tracks uh, even when you when you don't want that to happen it still does because they could be so loud and so bombastic that it hurts the other tracks because all mixes are are compromises as soon as you turn one thing up by necessity another thing gets lower even if you didn't make the other thing lower you made the first thing louder so it makes the other thing lower in comparison so a mix is a compromise uh the thing with this album is there are greater more musical minds than myself that worked on it and i'm not embarrassed or ashamed to say that to say that because it's the truth we have a great producer a guy named kevin burns uh he has an incredible studio uh in the maryland area that whole uh beltway area maryland uh washington dc uh, and he is also an awesome guitar player he played with uh, uh don dockin uh you know the dockin albums mm -hmm. of the 80s and all that uh he recorded an album with don dockin and, and you know to fill george lynch's shoes you got to be a pretty good guitar player and yeah. uh, he he more than than is and so he he's able to articulate musically and and in uh engineer language the stuff that i'm not able to and so and that's the beauty of having a really great engineer you know because i might say oh can you make my guitar louder guys and that might not be what is really needed. Maybe could you boost this particular frequency over here that will appear to make my guitar louder? 
mm-hmm. you know, but I don't know how to say that because uh, uh, I don't own a, a recording studio. I'm kind of honestly a primitive, you know, I'm going to put it right out there. I don't even have recording equipment in my house. And the bass player is also kind of a primitive. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I could show you what I came up with, what recording equipment I do have. And it's like a cassette deck. <laughs> <laughs> the record button on a cassette deck. And when I get really adventurous, I put, I'll line up two cassette decks together. One cassette <laughs> deck can play the first part, and then I'll play to the second cassette deck. So when, when I say I'm a primitive, I'm I'm really being honest. Uh, I think Ned knows a little bit more than I do. I think he finally got a uh, one of those uh, computer programs. Uh, I forgot what it's called. Uh, where you Pro Tools? Pro Tools. Thank you. He he finally got that, and he uh, got through the whole learning curve of it, and can do certain basic things on it, and. Uh, that's good. That helped out a lot that he was able to do that. Um, so getting back to that, we we have a great a great engineer producer on this album. All thanks and kudos really to Kevin Burns. He did a killer job. Uh, Ned Ned, you know, was kind of like a co-producer on it as well. But we all re- you know, sonically speaking, we all really defer to Kevin's opinion and uh, his take on what should be happening. And and that was important to us because I really don't care how great a band is, and there are some great bands out there, but if it's a great band, but the production sounds amateurish or sounds weak, it's very hard to get into it because we're all spoiled. This is 2022. We're spoiled, you know, we're used to hearing well produced stuff, mm-hmm. you know. So, so for that, I'm, I'm grateful and happy that somebody can listen to our CD and it, it really, uh, it holds up, you know, next to, next to the big league, you know. Let's say we're in the, uh, the minor leagues and, uh, Iron Maiden is in the uh, the majors. Uh, well, we want to be. We don't mind being a minor league team, but we want to have major league sound. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's ditto for the artwork, ditto for the whole package, because it's kind of always been my theory that the better and better you make your product, uh, the more the doors are. Are, are gonna open. Even if they're opening up real slowly like they have in the case of Burning Star, I see I see them starting to open more and more. And I see, you know, people responding to the quality of the stuff we've been putting out. Our last five albums have all really been well produced and well written, well sung and well played, well arranged too. So mm-hmm. you know and I can say that without sounding, you know, like egoed out or anything, because it's pretty much been confirmed by everybody. I can't sit here and tell you, yeah, they were planning out, al- they were planning them albums because they weren't. But I can mm. tell you that we did everything humanly possible to make them sound good, and and that includes even the album art, just everything. Yeah. Well, tell tell me this, Jack. You this is the the eleventh album. This is going to be album number 10. It's coming out Ten. this Friday. And uh, two of the albums were not Burning Star albums originally. They had different names. And then I thought, you know, some of the same guys in Burning Star are on those albums. Let's just make it easier for this growing legion of fans that we have around the world. And let's let's do a rename. So, uh, so Guardians of the Flame under a savage sky became burning star six under a savage sky and then there was another album simply called strider 
and I and then I was thinking, you know, Mike Torelli, who sang on three out Burning Star albums, is on that album. I'm on that album. Why the hell? What are we doing calling it Strider album? No, you know, it doesn't even make sense. And um, and then I got confirmation about that because I was having a discussion with Joey DeMaio for Manowar, who who signed signed Burning Star to a record deal a, a, about 10 years ago. We did we did one album for his label. And uh, Joey's a great guy and he's very knowledgeable on metal. And basically he he told me, and no one had ever said it to me before, but he said, he said, look, Jack, you created a lot of goodwill with the name Burning Star. Why are you putting out an album and calling it something else? It's it's your album, own it, call it a Burning Star album. And then 10 years later, when we change managers and we have a new manager named Giles Lavery, uh, I ran the idea past him. I said, you know, do you think it might be cool if we just call it a Burning Star album? Because, you know, uh, Mike Torelli and myself, you know, played on it and we really gave it that sound. And he goes, of course, he goes, you should. And ditto for the other album that you called Guardians of the Flame. I Personally, I don't understand why why that isn't called a Burning Star album. So mm -hmm. now that I had from these two guys whose opinion I really respected, I said, you know what? Those two albums are going to have a name change, which brought the amount of Burning Star albums up to 10. And this album coming out Friday is number 10. Yeah. Now, now tell me this of those 10 albums. Yeah. How many of them came out sounding the way that you had planned them to sound in the beginning? Cause I've been told often that once again, a journey, your intention is to go this way, but by the time the record's done, it's a different sound than what, uh, what was planned at the beginning. Uh, actually, a, a couple of them did, and sometimes it was um, the limitations of budget. Sometimes, sometimes it was the you know the time limitation. Uh, you got to remember, in the eighties and even in the nineties, studio time was super expensive. Y you were easily spending a hundred dollars an hour. So, if you didn't totally have your act together. Uh, you you were going to have to cut corners either on time or on the length of the songs or on something. Something was going to have to suffer right. to bring it in. You know, um, in the 80s, um, Burning, Burning Star, the, uh, the first Burning Star album got signed to a label called Passport, which was a very big independent label in the 1980s. They had uh, a lot of really big, big names on it. And, including uh, uh, Bill Wyman of the Stones. He had an album out called um, Willie and the Poor Boys. Mm -hmm. And I only remember that because when I signed with Passport, I was I was impressed, like, oh, wow, I'm going to be on a label with Bill Wyman of the Stones, you know. That appealed to, uh, to my ego, you know. Yeah. And uh, they had just had a hit record with uh, Year of the Cat by Al Stewart and, they had Wendy O. Williams, uh, Gene Simmons had produced her album, and they had uh, people like, uh, I think, I actually think Leslie West was on it, and uh, maybe uh, a couple of other, you know, like well-known people. And so when I was on that label, that I got a good advance for. But even that good advance was nothing. We that money got eaten up like after like a month and a half in, in studio time. And then I realized, you know, 30 grand is not a good advance in the eighties because you can't do much with it. You know, um, what was happening is, you know, you were expected to compete with bands like foreigner who were spending more than 30 grand just on the, on coffee. <laughs> on, on the deli around the corner bringing them sandwiches and coffee they were spending more than that 
you know what we were spending on the whole album right so so there's always been that um you know trying to uh do as much as you can with whatever you have to work with you know and uh and you know and i've never made excuses for that i've never said well you know rocky american way uh doesn't sound great because we didn't have an incredible budget it actually sounds really good and on that album uh there was a band that was very big where i was from called the good rats um a band that actually probably should have done way more uh but that's another story but anyway they were on passport and um pepe marcello who was the singer and uh main songwriter in that band uh produced one song on our album the title track why did he produce one song because that was all we could afford you know <laughs> he i think i think he got two grand to do it which wasn't bad back then to do one song uh mm -hmm. but uh so you know there was always that that uh budget thing you know now labels don't labels do not pay even 30 grand for an advance you're lucky if you get anything uh, on an advance and the stuff that we were selling back then that was so disappointing to record labels like oh you you know you guys should be ashamed you only sold eighty thousand, or you know or in the case of one of the albums that i did uh which actually sold about one hundred and fifty thousand. uh that would be like double platinum today in today's mm -hmm. world you know um but but today's world is you know it's a little bit different uh right in, in today's uh, world even getting signed to a label is like inc it's incredibly difficult to find a label that would actually risk money and risk putting up the costs of uh manufacturing a cd hiring mm -hmm. a publicist uh, studio time uh hiring a, a great artist hiring somebody to do all the media stuff it's phenomenal and uh and i'm here to tell you in 2022 burning star found a label global rock that is putting their money where their mouth is they uh they signed us they uh gave us an advance hired a publicist got great uh, great uh album art um let's see uh we got a media guy on board uh his name is phil simons uh all these things that you know are pretty pretty unusual for 2022 the, and uh it just really comes down to that they they believe in what we're doing and our man our new manager dallas lavery uh you know has to be definitely praised as well for for being the the liaison between us and global rock and making making this thing happen because i don't really know how to talk to labels i don't i'm really your arch typical musician uh i know nothing <laughs> Just let me make my record the way I want to make it, and then you guys go promote it, and we'll call it a deal. You, you pretty much hit the nail on the head. You know, I would like to one day learn more, but man, it's 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 far down the road at this point. You know, I've you know, I would love to have known a little bit more about the industry. Uh, some, I've you know, I've really made very little money playing music. It's just. It's a miracle that I've actually just survived doing it, you know, and uh, but I say that not with any kind of bitterness or anything, because I still feel I'm one of the lucky ones, you know, that that um, gets to put out albums on a regular basis. And if I could use a baseball analogy, since I used one before with the major and minor league teams, um, it's like the more times you get up at bat eventually you could actually hit a line drive or you could get to first base at least 
And um, maybe I'm being overly, you know, too optimistic, but I kind of, I kind of see that they keep, they keep letting us come back and, you know, come back and, uh, and get to the, get to the mound and they keep, they keep giving us strikes. So eventually we're going to hit one. I don't know if we're going to get a touchdown, but I have a feeling uh, we're actually going to get to first base with this album. Well, I was going to say, you know what? In this business, a single is a major success. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. I'll tell you, talk about the new album. Let's get into yeah. some of the tracks on that. Well, I want to start off by talking about the track that our bass player, Ned Maloney, wrote. Uh, it's tremendous. It's my favorite track on the album. It's called Ships in the Night. And in 2021, you know, while the pandemic was really raging uh, and everybody was, you know, afraid to travel, which I don't blame them. Ned said, listen, I'm going up to the studio up in Maryland. I want to do some stuff with the owner of the studio, Kevin Burns. I've got some ideas. And I'm going, uh-oh, I hope he doesn't ask for money. <laughs> and then he goes, he goes, no, don't worry. I'm doing it on my own dime. I'm going up to the studio. I'm going to be gone like three or four days. And uh, so I just said, man, you know, super. I don't, I don't even want to ask. I know whatever it is, it's going to be cool. So he comes back from the studio and uh, he plays me Ships in the Night and it's got a string section. It's got cellos, violins, and and I'm thinking this is really phenomenal. You know, we're, we're just a metal band, you know, and now it's like, he's like taking us into this next, you know, level. And, um, and it became my favorite song on the album. It just, you know, it just has this, this mood, this uh, good song should create an atmosphere, you know, when you listen to it. You know, like the first time I heard Walk Away Renee by the left bank, mm -hmm. it just took me into another world. And it was, or Wider Shade of Pale, or The Long and Winding Road by the Beatles, you know. And when Ned came back with this song and did what he did, that song entered that realm. And uh, I, I was just, I was blown away. And, you know, so that's the first song I would like to talk about. And I just did. Mm -hmm. Ships in the Night. Great song. Um, and I say that even though I didn't co-write it or have really much to do with it, except playing a guitar solo, which is actually a blues guitar solo <laughs> in the middle of this symphonic sounding metal song. Uh, but in, uh, in, in deference to, to Ned and Rhino, I did tone the bluesiness of it down, but it started off as a total Stevie Ray Vaughan kind of blues guitar solo. And I turned it into something more like a Brian May thing, uh, you know, from Queen. But anyway, so that's that first song. Uh, my second really favorite song is the title track. Souls of the Innocent. Um, I like it for a lot of reasons. Uh, number one, the lyrics are great. Fan really great lyrics. It's got a really important subject matter. It deals with uh, what happened in Las Vegas with the uh, the shooting and you know innocent people dying and you know being shot from, you know from a sniper. Uh, that's important lyrics. Uh, also. Uh, the music, the groove of that song, you know, that down, 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 down. It's, it has kind of like that heaven and hell kind of groove, you know, the Black Sabbath thing, uh, which Man of War also used on a, on a song called Warriors of the World. But you can't get too many of those. You know, I think uh, Uriah Heep used it also in uh, Stealing, you know, the song Stealing. Mm -hmm. By your eye, you know that. So that's one of my favorites. Um, also, demons behind me. Uh, 
which is the second video. So if your listeners go on YouTube and um, they punch in Burning Star, or Jack Star's Burning Star, demons behind me, they can hear it and know what I'm talking about. Um, the How's song, you the riff for that one? Yes. The riff, well, my, my mother, uh, even though she grew up in France, they were not, they, she was not born in France. She moved to France when she was two years old from Turkey. So Turkey has a lot of Mideastern music, you know, because they're kind of like in between a European country and a Mideastern country. And um, so I also listened to a lot of that growing up, those uh, Oriental scales, you know, that, you know, where it's not like Western music, which is, you know, Western music is very uh, linear. It's very, uh, you know, you know, I could explain it to you on a guitar. It's like, you know, each fret on a guitar represents a note. In uh, Middle Eastern music, there are notes within that fret. So there are half tones, that were, I guess what they call semitones. And so that riff in that song reminded me probably subconsciously of some of the music that I heard around the house, you know. Uh, which wasn't French music, wasn't American music, it wasn't, you know, blues or Motown. Mm -hmm. It was the Middle Eastern music. And um, so it comes out, you know, all right. All of the person's influences, you know, at some point or another, you know, they're going to come out, you know, hopefully. Right. Well, it, I've always found that artistic people are like sponges when it comes to absorbing all the things that pertain to their chosen field. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I mean, that's so well said. We're like walking, living, breathing sponges, you know, and uh, I'll always remember, I was reading an interview with B.B. King, who was like, you know, my guitar idol also when I was growing up. And he made me feel good in the interview because he said, he goes, when I was growing up, this is B.B. talking about growing up in Memphis. When I was growing up and I was around other guitar players, my favorite thing that I would say was, could you show me how you did that? That was my favorite thing. If I was around guitar players, it was like, oh, you know, can you show me what you did there? Because I was a sponge and I wanted to know what these guys were doing and how they were doing it and and you know i was you know i was like what you know like a 16 year old kid i wasn't i was harmless they didn't mind showing it to me you know i wasn't gonna you go weren't competition me. then i wasn't competition i you know i was just some kid that wanted to learn and it was like sure i'll show you how to play a whole lot of love or you know yeah i'll show you how to play going home by 10 years after and i would try to absorb as much of it as i humanly could you know and especially with the blues, I found that that was easier you know, for me to absorb. Uh, probably just because the nature of it, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't so much based upon uh, having a wah-wah pedal or having a uh, an incredible, great-sounding guitar or martial amp. It was really based upon vibrato. B.B. King, Freddie King, Albert King's, their whole thing is vibrato. It's what you do with, with your finger and how you can get the note to sustain and to sustain in a pleasing, round way. That note has to be round. Uh, if you were to ask me and I was in a truthful moment and I didn't want to appear like Mr. Modesty and, you know, why do you think you're a good guitar player? I would tell you first thing because I have good vibrato. Not everybody has good vibrato. Uh, Clapton, great vibrato. B.B. King, great vibrato. Gary Moore, great vibrato. Jack Starr, I've been working on it for 50 years on the vibrato. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not gonna toot my own horn, but 
let's just say that it's important to me, you know, having that vibrato. Michael yeah. Shanker, great vibrato. Uh, Tom Schultz from Boston, great vibrato. Jimmy Page, fantastic vibrato, you know. Mm -hmm. A lot of these guys today do not understand that, you know. They they kind of try to make up for the lack of the vibrato by playing a, a lot of notes and doing what they call sweeping, which is playing arpeggios. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. You know, I love all that stuff. But to me, what I want to hear, just on a personal level, is mm -hmm. I just want to hear guys with great vibrato. Leslie West, probably my favorite vibrato of them all. And here he is, just some guy from from Forest Hill, Queens. You know, just where did where did he get that? I heard I heard Mississippi Queen, even the first two notes when he goes down, -oh, down, -oh, even that that uh, mm -hmm. he could have just done down, -oh, down, -oh, or down, -oh, down, -oh, maybe given a little bit, but instead. He goes down, 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 and that's why that opening is so memorable. Yes, absolutely, and that's why fifty years later, I'm bringing it up. I mean, <laughs> it just made like this incredible impression on my young, inquisitive mind. It's like, who is this guy, yeah. and why does he do that? And and. It sounds like what BB's doing, but with more, more uh, amplitude. <laughs> yeah. You know? mm -hmm. So exactly. Well, that gets back to that whole. You know, if you're a copycat, it's not going to last. Do something different that's good. That right. lasts. Exactly. That's so so true. You know, and we try to do that in this band. Uh, I'm not saying we're reinventing the wheel, but I'm just saying, you know. We're putting our own spin on it. Uh, like if you listen to like, um, I don't know, you know, there's demons behind me, there's souls of the innocent, ships in the night, where eagles fly. Um, the, the melody in that song really is like a top 40 melody, but we set it to like this galloping uh, rhythm. Uh, and but the melody is like so it's a cool melody and the the rhythm behind it is like it's kind of like a galloping rhythm and we combine the two and we we got where eagles fly and um that's become one of my favorite songs so the funny thing is like with this album the songs that were my favorites two months ago, I started doing these interviews about about five weeks ago. The record company, uh, Global Rock, and our manager, Giles Lavery, had a plan. They didn't want to just throw the album out there. They wanted there to be uh, some, some pre-publicity uh, or pre to I don't know what the actual word is, but you know what I'm trying to say. Some right, just yeah, some, want to build that buzz. Exactly, and so when we started doing this, I had a preconceived notion in my mind of what critics and reviewers and people like yourself that host shows, you know, would like, and I was wrong. It's they've like a whole diverse group of songs, uh, not necessarily the ones you know. Like I thought they were gonna like this song, Attila. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, no one's mentioned it as their favorite song. Uh, I like the song, Attila. Comes in with a very cool. Um, guitar riff it's kind of a mm -hmm. very clean uh jangly kind of guitar riff you know where you where you, you're hitting chords but you're picking the notes within the chord and the drummer 
is doing this drum beat that if anything, it sounds like Pretty Woman by Van Halen, you know, like, you know, down, 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 down. Mm-hmm. So um it's so it's like you you know you don't really know what people are gonna like. And I don't even know what the best songs on this album are. And I want to say this, but I want to say it in total, total modesty. I like every song on this album. And I cannot say that about say that about any other album that we've done. Uh, and when I was a kid and I bought, let's say, a Bad Company album, if if there were three songs on the album that I really liked, I bought the album. I didn't even care about the other seven songs. Mm-hmm. If there were two songs on a Foreigner album that I liked, I bought the album. You know, uh, well, with, with bands like, you know, Deep Purple and Vanilla Fudge, that kind of changed my thinking a little bit because I would listen to the whole album in its entirety and like the whole album, you know, because Mm -hmm. those were the kind of albums that they were making. Um, Same thing with like, I'm a big fan of ZZ Top, but those albums, DiGuello and Eliminator and those albums usually had two or three album, two or three songs that I really liked. And I bought them anyway because I wanted those two songs. Mm-hmm. I wanted to hear Rough Boys, uh, my, my favorite ZZ Top song. It's on a ZZ Top album that I don't like. What is it? Afterburner. It? Yes, that's it. I mean, honestly speaking, I don't even really like that album. But I love that song. Uh, then you get some of the other bands similar, you know. So what I'm saying really is that I have bought albums when I've liked two songs, three songs, one song. I think every song on this album is good. And if I could transform myself into the 19-year-old kid that I once was, I probably would I would I would probably lump this album in with the other albums that I bought and just listened to in its entirety. I wouldn't be buying it because it had hot blooded on it or because it had cold as ice on it, which are great songs by the way, or because uh, you know, it had, you know, Blue Collar Man, you know, mm-hmm. a great stick song. I would be buying this album to listen to the, the whole thing. Yeah. I'll tell you, you mentioned Deguello. It's one of my favorite albums, period. Deguello? Yeah. Yeah, I, well, absolutely. That was a great yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't mention it in a way like it was, you know, you know, like they, you know what I mean? Like they didn't make a great album. With at, with Afterburner, I mean, I loved Rough Boys. I thought that was the best song mm. on the album. Stages, I thought, was a nice melodic track. Yeah. That was yeah. that's true also. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh but I'm a big ZZ top fan. I mean, you know, uh Reverend Billy can do no wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the guy the guy is great, has a great personality. Uh and uh you know, and it's kind of almost ironic, you know, that um that they're really not gonna be together in the same way, you know, that they were before because you know, when you take Dusty Hill out of the mix, you know, it, it's a really important part, you know, just like when, uh, you know, when John Bonham got taken out of the mix, you know, uh, uh, they were wise enough to realize that it really wasn't going to be uh, Led Zeppelin without John Bonham. Right. It just wasn't going to happen. Did the who realized that when keith moon passed away no but they absolutely ceased being the who Mm -hmm. when when keith moon passed away 
Uh, it's just, so, you, know, you know. In Zizi's case, when, when you've been that same trio for 50 years. Right. Then it makes an even bigger deal. Because, I mean, yeah, after fit, playing together for 50 years, you know when you're playing, you're tight. And it's hard yeah. to get somebody else to come in there and you instantaneously be where you were after playing together for 50 years. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's like going to see White Snake. Um, you know, they've had a lot of, you know, a lot of personnel changes. But as long as they have that drummer, whose name escapes me, because I'm old and I can't remember everything, but uh, but yeah, him. That, what? Yeah, him. Him. <laughs> Let's just call <laughs> <guy>. him. <laughs> just but that that drummer is phenomenal. You know, I went to see White Snake uh, three, four years ago at this place called the King Center. And uh, did this incredible drum solo. And he just played with such attack and such power that, and I'm not even really like one of these guys that, you know, I'm not, you know, that the drums are the most important thing on a record, but they are super important. But, you know, you can't help but notice when someone plays on that level. And, you know, obviously, Bonham has that, Carmine has that, Cozy Powell has that. Mm -hmm. The drummer in our band, surprisingly, also has that it factor. Rhino is a really good drummer. Uh, so for him to even, for me to even mention him alongside those other drummers. That's a pretty big like, compliment. Yeah, it's like the, the best compliment I can think of, you know. Uh, and... Uh, those are my favorite drummers. You know, like when I heard Rainbow Rising with Cozy Powell, I was like, oh my God, this guy is phenomenal. Like if you listen to the beginning of uh, of Side 2, uh, I don't even, I can't, I can't think of the name, but it starts off with drums. He yeah, I, I know like, what you're saying. And then it goes into... Dun, 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 look away from the sea i can take you spend a vision with me ah, look, look, ah, sleep with the devil the devil will pay what song is that anyway some, somebody will watch this exactly gonna, that'll be the first comment on there you guys couldn't remember this yeah and they're going to say, you know what? That Jack Star guy really is old. Uh, he, he, <laughs> well, it's not like I'm was... being much help to you. So. Yeah, well, because <laughs> because I'm in the same right... boat. I can't. I I know it. I can't think of it. He was right on the edge of remembering. Same thing with with remembering the name of that drummer. Th does that drummer's name start? Is his first name Tommy? From he was also in Black Oak, Arkansas. Yeah. Um and he played amazing in, in Black Oak, Arkansas. Yeah, uh, I should anyway. have taken my privilege in this morning. I might have been uh, more on my game here. Listen, I'm gonna have to start taking those uh vitamins, you know, about uh increased memory. Uh exactly I forgot what they're and I forgot what they're called, but <laughs> but the vitamin the vitamins that increase memory. There okay. you go. Note to myself, uh, go to GNC <laughs> tomorrow by memory. But then, you know, here's the funny thing. After we get done with this, it'll be like, oh, oh, darn it. I, you know. Oh, exactly. You know. Star. Wait. The Rainbow Song has the word star in it. Something star. Uh, the Rainbow Song has the word star in it. And Cozy Powell does that incredible intro in the well, beginning. Like you said, we'll, we'll, we'll think of it once we get this back. thing right. up. Enough <laughs> on that. I'm I'm here on a mission to plug <laughs> the new Burning Star record that's coming out Friday. So let me... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's, it's a blessing and a curse that, you know, I can just talk so 
relaxed and openly with you, you know, and we could digress. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it is coming out on Friday. And uh, but you but you did ask an important question about the uh, the songs, you know, the songs are they're all good. But mm -hmm. but I don't know if they're good in the same sense, you know, of having a hot blooded on the album or having, uh, you know, you know, hot blooded or or, you know, can't get enough of your love. You know, yeah. I remember buying that album because I thought that was an incredible song, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and it was kind of funny because I'll give you a quick aside. I was living on Long Island and I had a little cover band that we were trying to get going, you know. And the drummer in my cover band had actually been uh Billy Joel's drummer. Okay. In in Billy Joel's uh, first band, The Hassles. And uh and so I just remember it was right around that time period and I kind of I make these mental connections, you know, in my life to, you know, things that I might have been doing at the time, you know. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was around the same time Clapton had just put out a song called Motherless Children, uh, where he plays a little slide guitar on it. And uh, but again, you know, I think Clapton was doing what Bad Company was doing was he was looking for a song off his new album that could bring people into the record store to buy the whole album you know mm -hmm. i don't know if he succeeded maybe there was another song on that album you know that uh you know that did that for him you know right uh whereas you know deep purple they were just saying come into the record store forget about hush just come in buy the album you're gonna dig it mm -hmm. and uh and even though if they borrowed their whole style from the vanilla fudge it, it didn't matter because they were slicing and dicing it you know their own way um mm -hmm. and it to the point where you know i wanted you know to get the deep purple album and uh and then ditto for when uriah heat came along you know tremendous band in the style of deep purple you know that right epic you know metal a uh, lot of ham and organ going on and uh tremendous tremendous band uh um ken hensley whose name i do remember who was the keyboard player of uh uriah heap why do i remember his name because in the 1980s, he was working for St. Louis Music, and they were making the Laney amplifiers, the Washburn guitars, and all that stuff. And uh, I got an endorsement deal with St. Louis Music, and uh, I'm looking at the guy that signed the endorsement deal for Jack Star and Burning Star, and the guy that was responsible for me getting that were going that was going to get all these great laney amplifiers and, it's, and i'm looking at it, oh ken hensley i can't be the same ken hensley because ken hensley must live in england in some castle you know and, you know because that's how you picture all right yeah you, that's perception you know? yeah and uh so i wrote back to him because back then we didn't have the internet i, I had to write a letter and i was like you know excuse me mr hensley but, you know, first, I want to thank you for, you know, for giving me the opportunity to represent Laney amplifiers and Washburn guitars. I really appreciate it. And I hope, you know, we will do justice, you know, to your company. But P.S., I have a question. Are you, by the way, the same, you know, Ken Hensley that played, you know, incredible, you know, keyboards on the Uriah Heap, Heap albums? so like uh a week later i get i get a letter and he goes yes i would be him and i was like oh my god i'm like blown away you know here's one mm -hmm. of my childhood idols i don't want to say childhood i'm not trying to make myself that young one of my <laughs> idols. I, mean, I was right probably like still you know in my early 20s at the time 
But um, so I got back, uh, the, you know, the letter. And it just goes to show you how everything, in, you know, has come full circle. So like, even if I didn't get platinum albums or whatever, or gold albums, I still got enough encouragement along the way. Plenty of it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to, to know that I've been on the right track and to know that to keep going. And, and I can admit now, 30, 40 years later, that some of those endorsement deals really kept me going. Like when my son needed braces and there were four Blaney stacks in my living room, one of them was going to go. And it was just like, sorry, guys. And I can say it now because it's 40 years later. But, <laughs> you know, a lot of musicians, you know, endorsement deals are a really nice source of incomes. And I think, you know, musical instrument companies know that because they know that most musicians you're either billy joel or you're not mm -hmm. if you're not billy joel you're not raking in the big money you're getting by you know maybe you know you you could own a house and be okay you know i'm i, mean, I think i'm okay you know but but you're not billy joel so they know that um some musicians are gonna are gonna get rid of some of the uh stuff that they get as endorsements and it doesn't mean that they're not going to do a great job for the company that gave them stuff. I mean, I got, I got tons of stuff from ESP guitars, and some of them were uh, given away. Most of them, though, were actually given away in promotional contests, you know, like, you know, win Jack Stars guitar. So there would be like mm -hmm. a, a contest in like in a Greek rock magazine, like Metal Hammer Grease, win Jack Stars guitar. Uh, there's a big magazine in uh, Brazil called Roadie Crew. Don't ask me about where they got these names from, but it's a big, <laughs> it's a big glossy color metal magazine. And uh, so they ran a contest, win Jack Stars ESP guitars, uh, win his guitar, uh, metal, uh, metal forces, win Jack Stars guitar. We did one in Hip Parader, win Jack Stars ESP guitar. I mean, I gave away in promotional things at least a dozen of them. And I was wow. one of the very, very first people that endorsed ESP guitars. And, you know, it would be nice to get a little bit more credit and recognition for that. 98% uh, of the, of, when you think of ESP guitars, you think of Metallica. And that's fine. But truth of the matter is I was endorsed by ESP before Metallica. I was right at the very beginning, uh, endorsed by them when uh, I think they might have had maybe, I don't know, a handful of people that were endorsed by them. Uh, yeah. Like uh, like uh, the guy from a band called White Lion. Uh, really great guitar player, but he was endorsed by them. Uh, uh, have Obviously, you ever had a chance to uh, talk to uh, the guys in Metallica about your ESP endorsement stuff? <laughs> well, you know, I have like no contact with them, though I did meet them in 1984, uh, two of the guys and, and uh, our publicists and and people you know connected with our band were, were too happy not to mention it, uh, you know, that I had a nice meeting with them. Uh, we were doing a festival in uh, in France, the Breaking Sound Festival, and uh, Ozzy was headlining. Dio was up there, White Snake, Gary Moore, and towards the bottom of the bill were bands like Metallica, uh, Virgin Steel, Tokyo Blade, you know. And uh, so anyway, they had these tents set up backstage, and um, you know, so you know, we kind we had the smaller tents. Because Metallica was not, you know, part of the, you know, the big guys. Um, yeah, you know, the Aussies and the Dio's and the White Snakes. You know, they were like in the smaller tents, like we were in the kind of like in the back of the field, uh, which was, you know, which was fine. I was happy as hell to be on a bill with Ozzy, you know, with 
Dio, with Whitesnake, you know, with Gary Moore, mm -hmm. with Blue Oyster Cult. They were they were kind of like in the middle tense. <laughs> you know, they they weren't back there with us and they weren't up there with the Ozzy. I don't even you know what I don't even think I don't I remember Ozzy coming down the escalator with a golf bag to go golfing. Uh, <laughs> but um and honestly, I was like too intimidated to say hello. You know, I just didn't want to be, I didn't want to be a pain in the butt, you know. Right. Uh, so I just, I just, you know, I was just taking it all in. Oh, wow, cool. There's Ozzy. He's got a golf bag. Uh, he's probably going to get in a little exercise, you know, before tomorrow morning when, uh, when you know, when we were going to play like in the early afternoon, he was going to play that, that evening, you know. I think I think he was like the last guy to go on. So he was probably going to play after Dio, you know, and close out the whole thing. But anyway, so to make a long story short, you know, the guys in Metallica, two of them, it was the guy with the uh, curly dark hair, um, the guitar player in Metallica. The, uh, uh, James Hetfield. Oh, no, uh, uh, Kirk. Kirk, that was it. Was Kurt and uh, the bass player that passed away, Cliff Burton. Mm -hmm. So they stopped by our ten, and we're like shooting the breeze, you know. And I, you know, very nice guys, you know. I don't even talking about music or whatever. And then out of nowhere, uh, I, th I think it was Kurt said, "By the way, I want to tell you, you know, he, uh, your first album, it's a pretty cool album, and I really like this one song that you guys did." called Children of the Storm. So I just remembered it and I mentioned it in an interview. And the thing kind of got a little bit of traction just because they became the biggest band in heavy metal. You know? Right. So if they're listening, guys, I would really like if uh, you would cover Children of the Storm. <laughs> it's a great song and you guys liked it way back. So, you know, who knows? Just put that out there. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Just putting it out there, you know, and, uh, you know, and I think Cliff Burton said he liked it. You know, he was, I think he might have actually been the one that said it and not Kurt. I, you know, I, it's hard to remember. I just know there were two of the guys and uh, they said they liked it. And, and that was great. And normally it wouldn't have meant anything to me because, first of all, I didn't even think that they would even like the same kind of music that we were doing on the uh, Virgin Steel One album because they were really much heavier than we were. I mean, they were doing like this kind of like balls to the wall, you know, in your face, you know, mm -hmm. very fast, you know, doing a lot of, um, you know, double bass drum kind of, you know, thing. I don't even know if it was double bass drum, but it sounded like it. Uh, so I really didn't think that they would like what we were doing. And and I was really surprised, you know, that they said they liked it. And uh, so that coupled with the fact that they became the biggest band in the world, it kind of like, well, kind of like I mentioned it, you know, I think I mentioned it in an interview maybe like 10 years ago, and, mm -hmm. you know, and then, uh, and then later on some pictures surfaced of all of us posing for a picture from that festival. Oh, cool. So it's got me, uh, Rhett Forrester, uh, who was my singer at the time, who later joined the band Riot. It's got uh, those two guys I mentioned, uh, some of the guys from uh, Tokyo Blade, uh, the singer uh, Neil Turbin, that was on the first Anthrax album, and a bunch of other people. It's a black and white picture. Shows you, you know, how long it was. <laughs> but uh, our media specialist, Phil Simons, he actually colorized it and it looks incredible in color. So, uh, you know, so, so you know, I digressed a little bit, but, uh, you know, this band definitely has roots, you know, Burning Star, just like Metallica has roots, you know, and, uh, you know, people need to, to know that this kind of music doesn't come, you know, by accident. It doesn't come by hopping on a bandwagon. It comes by believing 
it, believing in it, sticking to your guns and uh, continuing, you know, to, to go with this vision. And even if, and even if you're the only guy that still believes in it and nobody is, is championing you, but yourself, you, you continue doing it, you know, and, uh, and in the beginning with Metallica, really, I mean, you know, they were, it was a tough, tough road that they were on. Mm -hmm. And I give them a hundred percent credit. I mean, I remember, uh, they came to play a small little place near where I lived on Long Island it was a club called Cheers. And, uh, I think I briefly talked to them, you know, and, uh, but I was impressed by the fact that these guys were on tour and how were they on tour in the most incredibly primitive way you could think of no big tour bus just piling into a big van you know and maybe how i think they had a u-haul on the back with equipment but this is what i noticed they had t-shirts for sale and on the back of their t-shirt were were the names of about 30 or 40 American cities that they had played in. So without having the luxury of a big tour bus and all this stuff, these guys were basically saying, screw how it's been done in the past. We're not waiting around for someone to give us an, invita an invitation mm -hmm. to tour. We're going to make it happen on our own. And that was like this prevalent attitude that was around back then. Mm -hmm. Virgin still, we didn't wait for somebody to sign us. Our first album, we put it out ourselves. And we were like uh, taking a lot of it in the trunk of our cars, going to record stores, you know, saying, hey, you know, we're Virgin Steel. You know, we put out this album. It's heavy metal. The guitar player Jack Starr is on this guitar player endorsed album called um it was called uh u.s metal volume two and it was uh it was put out by uh, this guy mike varney who was a columnist for a guitar player he was looking for like the heaviest you know kind of shredder guitar players you know mm -hmm. but you had to be unknown so it's like america's uh best unknown guitar players so anyway, I, I wrote away to that, to guitar player, to Mike Varney, thinking, oh, yeah, you know, what chance do I have, blah, 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 you know. Mm -hmm. A week later, Mike Varney calls me back up and he goes, uh, you're on the album. He goes, we want you on the album. And I just thought, wow, this is like incredible. It was just, it was just like the beginning of seeing things that, that could happen and that were happening. And, uh, and that was really what Virgin Steel used as a calling card because we use that to to make a store owner or a magazine reviewer be more interested in us because right. it was like hey yeah this is Virgin steel we play metal but we also got this guy jack star that's on this unsung heroes thing from guitar player so maybe just maybe the guitar playing will be okay you know because here's a guy from guitar player and then that album uh, it actually went on to discover uh, on the same album there was uh, this guy uh, Marty Friedman who was later in Megadeth. Uh, there was another guy named Michelangelo who is Michelangelo, the guy that plays guitars with like four necks on it, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, other people that that became known. The guy uh, Derek Frigio or Riggio. He joined the band uh, that had a hit record with uh, Fly High Michelle. I don't know if that rings a bell, but it was. Uh, but he was on that. He ended up with a hit record and, you know, a couple of other uh, right. people, you know. So that to me was like a confirmation. It was just like because let's face it everybody thinks they're great 
guitar players. Well, you, you, have you, you have to, you know, because if you, if you don't think that you're good enough to make it, you're not going to make it. You're not even going to try. Well, thank you for saying that because it's true. You have to have some ego. It doesn't mean be an annoying, obnoxious idiot. You know, oh, I'm great. You know, I, I'm better than Ingve or better than. No, it doesn't mean that at all. It just means, listen, I have something to say on this thing we call guitar. I think it's okay. Check it out. You know. Right. Um, so that gave me the confidence being selected to play on the sound because I figured in, that probably hundreds of guys, Guitar Player was a big magazine. It still is. Hundreds of guys probably saw the same ad that I saw and also thought, you know, that they were good enough to be on there. Right. So the fact that I got picked and that there were maybe 10 guys on that album, if that many, maybe eight, I don't know, 10 or eight, I'm not even, I don't even remember, but gave me kind of like, it was like somebody whispering in my ear, Dick, don't worry, Jack, you're okay, man. You're okay. Just keep doing what you're doing. Right. You know, you're okay. Not someone telling me, you know, you're better than Hendrix. Or nonsense. Right. Just stay the course. Yeah. Do what you're doing. You, you've got something to offer. And uh, and when this guy, you know, from Guitar Player confirmed that, I was like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep doing this thing. And uh, and Virgin Steel was able to really use that as ammo and that led to us being on about i don't know like seven or eight different uh um record labels in different parts of the world including britain where we were on this new label that they had come out with called music for nations and uh mfn and we were mfn number one we were their first release uh, their second, third, fourth releases were like Metallica, Merciful Fate with uh, mm -hmm. King Diamond, uh, Rat. The first Rat album was also on Music for Nations. And so, and I've said this to one of the guys in Music for Nations. I said that to him, like, I don't know, like 25 years later. And it wasn't really met with the kind of... Um, enthusiasm that I wanted. But I mm -hmm. said, but you know, I'm from originally from Long Island, you know, we kind of like, we kind of say what's on our mind, you know, we're, this is, we're talking about Long Island, New York, we, <laughs> we don't hold back. Right. So I told, I told the owner of Music for Nations, I said, you know, not for nothing. But if my band Virgin Steel and our album Virgin Steel one had tanked, would you guys have kept on going? Would you have kept signing metal bands? Or would you have kind of fallen by the wayside, you know? Because, I mean, in, I was just basically saying, look, indulge me. Give me a pat on the back, even right. if it's not 100% true. But I know <laughs> Work with me that here. it definitely, I know that it definitely helped. Right. If we had totally bombed, they had put money into us. Um, you know, made a very nice package, did a lot of publicity, got us into all the metal magazines and in Europe. So I said, so if we had totally tanked, were they going to be signing Man of War, Metallica, Merciful Fate, Brat, uh, all those bands? Maybe, maybe they, maybe they had enough deep pockets to do that, to absorb our abysmal failure, maybe. Or maybe they, maybe they needed us to give them some numbers, to sell some units, to make right. some noise. And Virgin Steel did that. We made a lot of noise. Uh, the album got released all over the place, Roadrunner Records, in the Benelux country, King Records in Japan. It made a lot of noise. 
Uh, yeah. And so that I think helped to uh, not just help them, but I think it kind of helped the metal scene. But when I say metal scene, I'm talking about, you know, the cult metal, not mm -hmm. the mainstream metal of like, you know, Deep Purple or, you know, bands like that. But this new metal scene that was coming out, you know, with Metallica, with Slayer, you know, and then I figured, you know what, this first album that I'm on, you know, did a lot of good for Virgin Steel. We'll see if I can do it again. And I got in touch with the guy that put out the Metal Massacre albums, who later went on to start a label called Metal Blade. So I got in touch with, uh, I think the guy's name is Brian Slagle. And he put us on that, on, uh, I think Metal Massacre 2. And that also was a really important thing. And I did it not just because I wanted to, you know, get my band version still out there, but there was a little bit of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A little bit of self-interest because it was making me well-known as the guitar player because I, at that point in the band, I was getting a lot of uh, the limelight, you know, mm -hmm. more than the other members. Not because I was really looking for it, but because things were more guitar driven in the 80s, you know, and I had come out on a guitar driven thing, which was, you know, by guitar player. So how could I not, you know, so I was getting a lot of that attention. And uh, when I was ready, when I went solo and when we had a parting of the ways, I knew that it was going to be easier to get a record deal because of everything that had happened before. Mm -hmm. And um, sure enough, I got a record deal and uh, it was very cool. It was, uh, it led really, it was just really led to where we're at now, a hundred years later. I was able to just keep on making albums, uh, keep on playing, uh, and, and and keep on having this really large cult audience. Mm -hmm. And ironically, it just keeps getting bigger. It's a beautiful it thing. Started, yeah, it started off as like this, you know, small cult audience confined basically to uh, America and maybe a little bit in England, mm -hmm. you know, because of, you know, music creation. Then it started getting where like, I'd start hearing about, you know, Greece, there were metal heads in Greece, metal heads in Holland, metal heads in Finland, in the Czech Republic, uh, Czech Republic, um, Russia. They were, they're, they've been bootlegging Burning Star albums in Russia for like 25 years. And I mean, what can you do? You're gonna mm -hmm. hire, Russian lawyers spend like ten thousand dollars to recover fifteen thousand or twenty thousand. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing you can do. You got to hope that those that uh, you get to to play Saint Petersburg or Moscow or something <laughs> and recoup it through ticket sales. <laughs> yeah, that's and you know what, that that would eventually be what's going to have to happen. Um, I just did an interview yesterday with Mexico and we were talking and, you know, and I mentioned that, uh, you know, we get a lot of interest in fan mail and all that from Mexico. And I was, uh, I was talking to this one uh, female fan from Mexico city. And she goes, Oh, you know, your great, your band is great. Blah, blah, blah. And I, and I just bought your t-shirt yesterday in the flea market. And I'm thinking, <laughs> she bought our t-shirt we didn't even have a t-shirt for sale at that time and it just and I'm, and I'm putting like two and two together and i'm realizing the um the, the reach that our band is having you know uh, in places that i didn't even think of it you know yeah that somebody thinks enough of our band along with them bootlegging the slayer and the man war and uh Metallica, they're bootlegging Burning Star, go figure. <laughs> so 
you know, those kind of things, you know, it, it kind of like, it puts you into a good mood and at the same time a bad mood. Right. It was like, you know, well, that's great. You know, people like me. So the egotist. How do I get in, compensated in, now? <laughs> right. That's the part too. You know, you, you start thinking, wow, I wonder if this scene is getting repeated in other places. You know, like well, you know it is. Yeah, you know it is. And you know you're never really going to see that money until you really get to that next level mm -hmm. where there's lawyers in every country that are ready to go into action, where there's a really strong manager who basically is not going to take it lying down. Right. We like, now have to pay all those people. <laughs> you yeah. Know, yeah. Go, well, okay, where's my compensation? <laughs> yeah. Those people, great managers, great labels, and, not, and they're not going to work for nothing. But you know what? In the long run, it's really worth it. And mm -hmm. we're finally at that point where I can tell you in 2022, I'm not predicting great things are going to happen, but I am predicting one thing. Uh, Burning Star is going to get a lot less counterfeited. <laughs> I, I could see it already happening. I can really honestly already see it happening. Um, if we were at the point we were at with the last album before it came out, our album, Stand Your Ground, was already available in about three or 400 file sharing platforms around the world before it came out. Wow. This album is not on one. Anybody that wants the album, they have to wait till Friday to hear it, or they have, would have had to have bought it, or they would have to have been uh, an, an, a media outlet like yourself. Right. So already there's a change that, I, that I'm seeing occurring now. I, I don't want to sound like I'm cocky. Oh, well, that means we're going to become, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, it just means that we're going to get ripped off a lot less. <laughs> exactly. You know? And I might actually see some money. Who knows? Uh, and if it, it's right. Exactly. You know, but I'm at the point now, you know, you, you learn to live modestly. You really do. And, and, uh, and there's no problem with that whatsoever a lot yeah. of these people you know that are making like tons of money you know because they've had platinum albums or whatever are they are they really any happier i doubt it you know i mean i just saw the elvis movie last night incredible movie perfect example of someone that had the world at his feet but he wasn't really uh, happy you know, it's the only time he was really happy was when he was actually uh, singing the music that he loved, that he grew up with. When he could somehow, you know, get back to his roots, then he was, you know, really happy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I can tell you honestly, I've been happy the whole time. I've been doing what I want to do and making what I consider to be really great albums, and. Uh, and just do you know doing it my way and uh so even if absolutely nothing happens with this album which i can't even really even say that anymore because it's already doing better than the last album and it hasn't come out yet there you go. it hasn't come out yet and it's doing better than the last album uh which is really a weird thing to process right but even whatever even like six months down the road the whole thing fizzled uh I will still have that knowledge that I did a good album and there still will be a slightly bigger cult of people that like Burning Star and that would pay money to hear me play, to hear my band play, to hear the bass playing of Ned, the great drumming of Rhino, the vocals of Alex, to hear us come to their town and do what we do. So mm -hmm. how can you beat that? You know, even if there's, 30 people in the audience it's like i'll take it because i know that they'll be the loudest 
most demonstrative into it 30 people that i could probably find exactly exactly jack we'll tell you what that sounds like a perfect point to to wrap this one up on absolutely so. yeah i i want to tell you i really really enjoyed this interview and you know thank you for letting me talk you know i'm from long island sometimes we like to talk sometimes we don't but you caught me in one of my i like to talk moods so so that was a cool thing uh, if you'd caught me like two weeks ago three weeks ago i, I wasn't in that mood i who knows why you know we're all like so <laughs> complex you know but you caught me in that mood and i was real and i'm really grateful that you gave me that opportunity yeah. to talk about Thank you know and, and at the and just to quote joe perry let the music do the talking so i really hope your listeners go on youtube type in jack stars burning star listen to the videos there you That's go that, on the youtube channel all the albums are out there and i'm guessing the new one will be there soon it will be yeah starting on the 15th yeah all right sounds good well on that note we'll wrap this one up jack thanks for uh, spending your time with us here thank you so everybody. much for having me on and i i really appreciate it thank you not a problem all right everybody Take have care. a good night you too Bye -bye. this has been music night at the majestic with michael boswell if you enjoyed this edition of Music Night at the Majestic, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and at musicnight.net. Music Night at the Majestic is a copyright production of Starliner Media. Any use of the accounts and descriptions of this program, its audio or visual content, without the express written consent of Starliner Media, is prohibited. Thank you for joining us this evening. We'll see you next time for Music Night at the Majestic. This is your announcer speaking.